Hi everyone, uh, I'm Alan and Paolo's going to be, we're, we're double teaming this talk, so it's going to be good fun. Okay, so this talk is, about, is uh, about how all of the provider records for Elast Elastic IPFS content are discoverable in the DHT. And so we're talking about how all of the content that was ever uploaded to web3.storage, nft.storage, um, so that's currently hundreds of terabytes of blocks are discoverable or basically resolvable to our peers ID when you query the DHT. Um, and so this is a deep dive into exactly how uh, we do that uh, in Elastic IPFS. Uh, so first of all, let's talk a little bit about why we're talking about discovering content. Uh, the, the problem we have is that um, we're at scale. NFT.storage and Web3.storage have over 90 million uploads between them. That's over one and a half billion uh, blocks. We have over 40 IPFS nodes in uh, clusters trying to write provider records to the DHT. It's just a lot, <laughs> a lot of stuff. Uh, and so we bought ourselves some time by uh, turning on the accelerated DHT when that became available. We, uh, we switched our data store from Badger to FlatFS for, to eke out that extra performance. Um, we also recently considered um, actually just uh, changing our providing strategy to just roots. Uh, but we uh, kind of didn't really want to do that, and luckily we didn't, we didn't have to. Um, there's also wider, as um, I think Will touched upon as well, there's wider concerns about being a good citizen on the IPFS network. Like the number of records we're expecting other peers to store, um, uh, as well as like the bandwidth costs to kind of send, in, send them to them and continually do that, it's quite, um, it's quite a lot. <laughs> uh, I think Will said it was like, four meg per peer of just provider records. Um, that doesn't seem cool. Um, uh, and so what we found, and it's not super surprising, is that at some point, there's just too many CIDs uh, for a single node to provide to the DHT. And it's also kind of annoying to pinpoint uh, that tipping point. Um, if you've got like popular content and your node's gonna be really uh, busy with reading stuff as well, like it depends on things, stupid things like system, like the system file system type, the like if you rated your disks, if you got like, and it varies from disk to disk um, and stuff like, like, like that, which makes it really difficult to know when you've put too much stuff on your node. But in general, just don't let them get too big. Uh, so this is a, uh, it's not super easy to see on the screen, unfortunately, but um, it's a graph of the percentage of DHT records found that say that this particular peer uh, has this content. And uh, it's over a period of about a month earlier this year, and it's for one of the oldest nodes in the clusters. That node has got about 70 terabytes of data on it, uh, and it's not doing great. They're very low, low percentages of uh, found provider records in the DHT. Um, and uh, just so you're clear, we're, like we're checking for uh, for content we know is stored on this node. So we're expecting to see a DHT record on the DHT. Um, the y-axis only goes up to 55%. So uh, yeah, that node is not having a good time. Uh, so conversely, with like 20 terabytes of data, uh, things are a bit better. Um, still not great. <laughs> uh, it's got some brief periods of awesomeness, uh, but it's mostly bad. Uh, and uh, you can sort of see this slow decline as the disk fills up. Uh, it gets worse and worse at being able to provide um, stuff to the DHT. So um, there you are. Uh, so for comparison, this is Elastic IPFS. This is when, uh, this, is, this is happy days. This is when the index of nodes came online and started slurping up all of the advertisements that we'd been writing. Um, and uh, just to be clear, this is all of the data like we have, all, everything. Uh, and it's, we went from nearly 0% found DHT records to uh, like almost 100 all the time. And it's stayed this way ever since. And it's continually um, slurping up stuff. This, this is like hundreds of terabytes of data, billions and billions of CIDs. Um, and yeah, so it's, uh, things are good uh, at the moment. Uh, that's really cool. Um, but how does Elastic IPFS achieve this? Well, uh, it makes use of the indexer nodes uh, and they are purpose built to map CIDs to content providers uh, for the scale of the I uh, Filecoin network. And we're, we're I guess, relatively small com compared to the, the whole of the Filecoin network. But um, essentially indexer nodes work by, um, you ask them like who has a CID and it tells you who has it. Uh, 
pretty simple, right? Um, obviously, someone has to tell the index of nodes before you ask them uh, who, who has it. Um, and uh, there are actually multiple ways to uh, tell an index of nodes, I mean, two ways, <laughs> uh, that you have a CID. And so Paolo is going to tell you specifically how uh, Elastic IPFS does it. Hello again, folks. So, um, as Alan was anticipating, we have two ways to ingest data to the indexer node using the, um, the API they, they provide. The first one is based on libp2p and gossip sub, while the other one is a two phases HTTP based one. Let's analyze the first one libp2p and gossip sub, right? Now, let me ask you one question How much money do you have? Because that's the main issue here. Because this method is very good, very fast, but the problem is that we cannot use that on EIPFS because we are on the cloud. So maintaining long-living connection is expensive. And using a verbose protocol like Gossip Sub is as expensive as well due to the, the overhead in the data transfer. So it will impact costs as well. So we're going to throw a lot of money out of nothing, basically. But there's even, even more. Even if, even if, let's say, you have infinite money, there are technical limits that cannot be bypassed very easily. The main one is that, as Francisco was anticipating this, mon uh, this morning, is that EIPFS from the outside is just a regular node, like every, anybody else. One peer ID, which is, seems to be just a machine, but actually are tons of machine, right? The implication of that is, is that there is an optimization in the lib P2P stack is, that says that if you try to connect to a destination, to the same destination from two different sources, which, which share the same peer ID, lib P2P will try to merge the streams in a single connection and drop the other one. Therefore, the communication will be dropped and not effective. We cannot support that. So let me introduce you a very old friend, which is HTTP. That's lightweight, is, is everywhere, everywhere is stateless, and the, the long-living connection, which is basically HTTP keep alive, are opt-in. So if you want to use it, whether it, this also applies on the client, on the server. The server can refuse a keep alive connection from a client if they want to. So that's the ideal situation from cloud environments because it's very lightweight and you can drop as, uh, as soon as you need it. So we use that, right? Now, how do we use that? The, Ingest API of the uh, indexer nodes requires us to provide the advertisements and ent entries data over HTTP. That's it. That's all they ask us. Moreover, we need to maintain an additional head uh, link to the latest advertisement that, the that has been published because the entire idea behind this uh, indexer node is that there are blockchain approach to this thing. So you can reconstruct to the head to, to the from the head to the tail of the queue anytime. So if your node is gone, drops, you do your hard disk is, is damaged and so forth, you can reconstruct from the beginning. Now, I'm not saying you can really do that because in order to reconstruct billions of records, you must, probably will take you centuries, but theoretically speaking, you could if you want to really waste a lot of time there. Anyway, once you have all the data available via HTTP, all you need to know is that make a put request to that slash in the ingest slash announce route and which basically will signal the indexer node to say, look, I have some data, please get it. Now, this last thing is also the reason why uh, for all that attended Francisco the conference this morning, right, out, right after publishing data through web3.storage, you cannot immediately fetch it using the DHT because we cannot predict when the indexer node will actually fetch the new, new advertisements and therefore publish on the DHT. There's something we can't control. Usually it happens fast. I mean, fast, I mean, let's say meals, hour, whatever, but for sure not days. So it's pretty available. And on the, the you've just got the pull from S3 directly. Yeah. If you put your own server in between, you can watch it. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So what will the indexer node will do on their side? Like we said here, first, fetch the slash add and say, what is now the latest advertisement? Two, fetch this advertisement. Three, analyze the entries which this advertisement points to. And then repeat, 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 
until you get to a point that you meet an advertisement that you already processed, so the, basically the old head of the queue, and you're done. All the data is now available in the DHT via whatever Alan will tell you later. I don't want to make any spoiler. Now, let, let's level, take a brief look to the different files involved in this case. The slash add file is a very simple structure file. For the sake of this uh, talk, what do you really care about is the line number three that says what is the CID of the current ad latest published advertisement. That's it. All the rest is a signature and a, a public key, but we don't really care about that. Then we have the other advertisement files which carries much more information. On line two and line, uh, where is that, 18, there, is, there are information about the current provider. In this case, that's the peer ID of the um, Elastic IPFS cluster and uh, its addresses, I mean, which is a single address in this case over there. And then on line seven, there is the link to the entries that we are now saying we provide over the Elastic IPFS bit swap. And then the entries file, which is just a link of CIDs, nothing, nothing more. That's pretty, pretty simple. Now, as Alan said, we have a lot of blocks and a lot of new glo blocks get added every day. If we mis mishandle the concurrency, first of all, the queue will explode very easily before we even realize, first. And second, if we lose any advertisement, this advertisement will be lost forever because nobody will be able to ever find it because it's not advertised by anyone. So there is no uh, provider associated. For the same reason, there is a concurrency, I mean, there is a racing problem when updating the head of the queue, because if two, basically, if two workers are try to upload the queue at the same time, one of them will fail and the advertisement will be lost. So the entire chain of the advertisement is lost. So how we managed to do that? Well, we just did, we just did something very obvious, reduce the size of, size of your problem. How we use the usually divided tempera issue, so that instead of going one gigantic processor, split it. We split the process in two steps. The first one is that we get all the new blocks that we receive from the indexing part, which are in a SQS topic, and we group them together by a number of 10,000. In this case, since SQS is an exactly once delivery, we don't care about the ordering. We know that each uh, CID will finish in one entry file. We don't care which one is that. Once we compute this entry file, we um, NQ its CID in another topic, another SQS topic. This SQS topic is fed to another lambda, which will group these all these entries file in another batch of 10,000. Create, um, sorry, we'll, we'll, we will, we'll, there will be an execution per each 10,000 entries. Each entries will become an advertisement file and gets uploaded. And internally in memory, we keep the sequence of these advertisements. At the end of the day, we update the ad only once with the latest advertisement that we have processed. Now, the very important thing here is that the latest lambda has the concurrence limited to one. So we just have one execution for this thing. The result of this is that we reduce the order of magnitude of the problem by 10,000, which means that in theory, to handle one million upload, sorry, one billion uploads per day, we just need a thousand execution of this second lambda and we are able to do that pretty easily. That's it. That's, uh, that's 10,000 entries per execution, right? Uh, that's the same because uh, each advertisement is bound to a single entry file. So we, we, group, we group things twice. Well, my question is, is that a typo then? Uh, you mean uh, over there, right here? You mean here? Yeah. Uh, no, it's not. Because uh, blocks, each block goes into an entries file by engrouping by 10,000. This, this block becomes an entries file, and each entries file is mapped to an advertisement. And each advertisement is bound to a one execution of the second lambda, what we call the publisher advertisement lambda. It's all executed once, but in this case, in the first case, we were grouping um, manually 10,000. In the second case, 10,000 is a limit given by AWS. So AWS says you can receive up to 10,000 messages per, uh, per event generated from SQS to Lambda. And that's why we get to 10,000. But each advertisement is maps to one entry. I mean, if you think about this earlier. 
you use it on uh, on line seven. Jobs maps to a single entry file. Well, this is an advertisement file. Maps to an entry file. That's it. And so that's uh, where was I? Yeah. So that's how we were able to reduce the size of the problem pretty easily and handle the huge load that we have. Finally, this is an overall view of what I just said. That's the diagram of the architecture. So it all starts on the top right, when there is the SQS multi ashes topic. Then there is the first lambda execution that will output both to S3 and to SQS. Then goes to a second lambda. Then eventually we'll also update the advertisement to S3. And finally, only once per execution, notify the indexer node that at some point later in the future will say, OK, let me fetch everything. From that moment, data is available to the DHT in a way that Alan will explain you now. Thank you. OK, so once it's in, once it's in the indexer node, how does, how does how does it become available on the DHT? For, so uh, for that, we need to talk a little bit about the, um, the Hydra nodes, which we, I think people have already, uh, already talked about uh, a little bit, um, but this is kind of a bit more in depth. Um, so anyway, how does it become available on the DHT? Well, um, the Hydra nodes are just uh, IPFS nodes, and they're designed to uh, help the DHT. They position themselves uh, such that when you query the DHT, you're, you're pretty likely to run into one. Um, they're just everywhere, and they're kind of help, there to help out. Uh, the kind of the key thing is that they share a uh, data store. So if one Hydra head knows about something, then all of them do. Uh, just like a real Hydra, uh, they uh, share the same belly of data with many heads. Um, uh, and so, yeah, the, the kind of cool thing about them is that they prefetch provider records. So when someone asks, uh, asks uh, <laughs> who has the bear, um, the uh, the and the Hydra nodes don't know, then they'll respond and say, I don't, I don't know. But behind the scenes, what they'll do is they'll actually query the network and find that information. So next time, uh, they can be, they can tell uh, whoever asks uh, what the actual answer is. Um, so yeah, it's this key kind of like getting provider records and caching them so that next time they're available and also being available all over the network. So. Um, the difference now is that the hydras have been updated, and now when a hydra is asked about that bear, uh, it actually delegates that query to a network indexer, uh, if it doesn't already know the answer, obviously. Um, and then so the network indexer is able to say that Elastic Provider uh, has that teddy bear. Uh, and so by virtue of the hydra heads being prevalent on the network, you'll almost always get an answer uh, without having to explicitly issue provider records to the DHT. Uh, yeah, so there we go. Send it on. Uh, Does it get stored, that Yeah, I think it gets cached still, yeah. So, 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 it's so if there's a lot of requests, it eventually is going to cache all the hot set in Hydras? Yes. Uh, yeah, there's a cache in the Hydras. Yeah, I know, yeah, yeah. I do, yeah, I, I didn't do the implementation in Hydra, so I don't, can't yeah. speak to it, like if that's then cached in Hydra. I, I, I meant, yeah, Will's nodding, so yeah. <laughs> do we know how long it stays there? I think it's an LRU, so I think it's until it gets to like that. Cool. Okay, so uh, the, the requests that Hydra make uh, to the indexer nodes are actually uh, what we call reframe messages. It's a spec for transport agnostic request response messages. And what the hydras use is the find providers method. Um, but this spec is kind of part of a bigger kind of delegated routing protocol that the hydras are sort of participating in. Um, so that, that's cool. Uh, and then so this it sort of ends up like this, uh, where the uh, our Elastic IPFS implementation is basically telling the network indexes uh, what CIDs it has. And then uh, the P, uh, IPFS nodes on the network are able to find that information via the hydras at the moment. This is kind of a temporary situation. Uh, the, 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 the indexer nodes will eventually, like we talked about earlier, be uh, queryable via IPFS directly and, uh, and, and other ways which I'm not entirely in that <laughs> situation to explain about. Uh, but um, this is how uh, Elastic IPFS currently works and gets all of the data that we have ever uh, available on the DHT for, um, for people to, uh, to query and respond to and have nearly 100% um, provider record um, coverage for all of our stuff.
Cool, thank you. <laughs>